Those of us that have been in the race long enough that saw it as a suicide run. I think when we uh, when we were leaving Singapore and we had the uh, the weather briefing that morning, we were all pretty quiet because we knew that uh, we had about five hours of nice sailing ahead of us, and then we were going to be getting into some pretty nasty stuff that was only going to get worse. Yeah. And it was uh, some of the biggest seas I've ever seen. And uh, you know, we were really in, in survival mode. I remember looking at these super tankers. You know, you see them when they come past, they're like high rise, floating high-rise buildings. And then you see them in those conditions and the waves were breaking over the tops of the bridges of these ships. The, con the sea states and conditions were that bad that there was a couple of times where I said, right guys, you, we got to minimize the number of people on deck, so I want you all below. And um, we had a massive attrition rate you know, as well there. We, I think we lost four boats out of that leg. I think two boats had to retire permanently out of the leg. We'd been through a very wild night and we'd damaged the mainsail. So we were taking it off to go downstairs and fix it. And I went down there and the whole head area of the boat was full of water. Said, Hang on a second, this isn't good. And I went up to the watertight bulkhead where the door was actually shut and tapped it out and thought, hang on, that's pretty full up there. And I opened the door and it was met by a gush of water as it was washed on my back. So we actually clambered up in the front there and we could feel around. You could feel where all the structure of the yacht had fallen apart. And then uh, I actually put my hand through the hole in the hull. But it was the same size as my boot. So I stood on the hole and got the guys to pass a Sikaflex gun through, which would glue and glued my boot over the hole and stood there while we got the pumps up there and pumped it out. So eventually we were actually able to get all the water out of that area and get the situation under control and then we cut the boat, you know, various parts of the boat up to uh, sort of build up a structure that could keep the boat, the integrity of it as best we could until we managed to get it back to Taiwan. And then the Taiwanese Navy came out and sat alongside us and escorted us into uh, a harbour in the northern end of Taiwan there. You work the solutions and you start seeing, you know, an impossible situation all of a sudden a solution can appear and then you work that through a little bit further and it was an incredible story because within a 48 hour period the designers were called, the design of that section of hull was sent to a manufacturer in Italy who machined a mould, built that section of the hull overnight, then loaded into an aeroplane and flew into Taiwan from Italy. Then in the meantime the boat was put on a barge and shipped down the coast and picked up with two cranes and we found a shed that we could work in. This fantastic build team was flowing down from various parts of the world came to Taiwan and we cut the section of hull out, spliced in the new one that was built in Italy, laminated it all in, fixed it all up, put the boat back in the water and got going again and um, basically the fleet had left. So when, when we arrived, the fleet had left that, that lunchtime. So they were sailing out and we were sailing in. And then the turnaround became the next crucial part and that was super crucial, you know, there couldn't be, you go to sea for 40 days, there could be nothing missing. So the crew stepped off, they went and had something to eat. Short team got on there and did absolutely everything to the boat, fueled it up, re-prepared it to go to sea, changed sails, changed the mainsail and then off we went to sea again. The, the Professor Axel um, obviously pulled a master move during that leg which has really defined him as a navigator. But he saw an opportunity and they went for it and it was a pretty high risk thing to do at the time and I know there was a lot of discussions coming on and off the boat and even when they went to go and do it, they, obviously they did that and ended up with a close to a 360 mile lead over the rest of the fleet as, as they pulled that move off. But it was also a function of coming from behind, you know, sort of where they were, they could see this weather system in front of them, how it was going to affect the boats, and they had the window and the opportunity to go the other way. Some of the boats got within four or five miles of them by the time they were at Cape Horn, but they managed to sail from Cape Horn to Rio and extend again. You know, they managed to put that four or five miles back out to 40 or 50 miles. So, uh, you know, that was not by good luck, that was, that was just good sailing. Well, we managed to solve an insurmountable problem, let alone that you could go from that, starting behind, and then go and win the toughest leg in the race after that. So it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was a pretty big time for us in that team. You know? The Volvo Ocean Race Sailors, you, you don't sail around the world for the money, and you don't sail around the world for your, you, you do it for your own personal ambition, but it's just a different type of drive inside you to, to do extraordinary things. And I think you know, the willpower it takes to do that, that's what willpower is. So the whole Volvo Ocean Race is just one massive great big cooking pot of willpower. We have some very colourful people in this race. <laughs>